Okay, so, um, you know, all of my life in my professional career, I have had reason to learn languages, but I became very interested in learning languages at the age of 55 when I decided to learn Cantonese. And I spoke Mandarin, and I had a, a sense of Cantonese, but I couldn't really speak properly. And so I got involved with, and of course I could read Chinese, but I couldn't pronounce Cantonese, and I couldn't understand it. So I discovered at that time the mini disc player, which was my first exposure to sort of a, a miniature, a very small device that had the power of, of language labs in a way that I was familiar with, you know, 30, 40, 50 years earlier. And of course, the mini, the mini disc player is in the dustbin of history now, but it was the first in a series, right? The iPod Nano, the iPad, the iPhone, or Android, whatever, all of this other stuff has come in behind it. But I discovered that then the power of massive input, and I started reading some of the things that Stephen Krashen was saying, and it, it really uh, resonated with me in my experience of language learning. And I wrote a book, in fact, although most of my career has been as a diplomat or a, or a businessman, I wrote a book of my, about my experience in language learning. And at that time, I spoke nine languages. And I wrote that book in 19, you know, in 2002, when I was, say, 60. And now, as I'm approaching my 70th, I'm in my 70th year, uh, I've learned another six languages since then by applying uh, some of the things that I learned from Stephen Krashner, or which, which kind of reinforced what, in, in fact, I had done to learn the nine languages up to, that, up to that point. And if I refer back to the last 10 years, what I remember most is my experience with those languages, the sort of experiential learning. And that's why when Donald and I, Donald and I were speaking, this term experiential learning came up. And I think, for example, of, of listening to, you know, um, Czech history or, you know, Turgenev in Russian or, uh, you know, uh, whatever, discovering, you know, listening to them arguing on Russian radio about how they, you know, the way they get so wrapped up and intolerant in their presentation and their views. And, and so there was this experience as a reader and a listener that I remember. I don't remember that much the sort of interactions, the speaking, which I, I did some of. So that this whole experience, this experiential approach to learning is something that I want to talk about today. And it reminds me of the uh, Sufi, which is a uh, I'm not an expert in Islamic philosophy, but it's a, a form of Islam. And there's apparently a Sufi expression, which is, you can only learn what you already know, which is kind of interesting. And was very much my experience in learning, for example, to produce the language correctly. It, to get a handle on the grammar, you already had to have a lot of experience with the language, you almost had to know it in order for these explanations to have any meaning for you. So, so I thought that was that, that had an application for language learning. And another very interesting sort of pearls of wisdom uh, were the sort of words of Dr. Marianne Lyman Hager, whom some of you may know, who is the director of the Language Acquisition Resource Center at this at San Diego State University. And she said, when I attended this ACTFL conference in San Diego back however many years, five, six years ago, she said, there's only three things that matter in language learning. The attitude of the learner, time with the language, and the ability to notice. And I thought that was very profound because I think that is very true. In my experience, successful language learners just throw themselves into language learning. The majority of language learners aren't so very successful. And they tend to say, I can't do it, I don't like it, I don't like the language, I don't want to learn it, it's hard. And so there's this tremendous resistance. And to the extent that they themselves, or because of the intervention of a teacher, they can be converted into people with a positive attitude, that has a huge impact on their success. So attitude number one, Time is obvious. Any of us who are either learners or teachers know that it takes a long time to learn a language. It's not like a couple of weeks, whatever. However, they advertise it. You know, you buy these books. This little book will make you proficient in language X. It's just not that easy. 
So attitude, time, and then the ability to notice, which is a little more um, of, of an elusive concept. Uh, and obviously, uh, you know, uh, grammar, explanations, making mistakes, and all of these things can help us to notice if we want to notice. I still think the biggest thing is just a lot of experience again with the language because everything is very fuzzy at first and gradually we notice certain things and then we start to notice other things. But uh, I mean, uh, an experienced language learner notices new structures, notices that things are pronounced differently. A person who's not experienced, and I often use the example when I was stationed in Japan and we'd get Canadians visiting and I was in the lumber business and I would introduce them to Mr. Kato. K-A-T-O, Kato. And he would say, uh, my name is Kato. And they would say, hello, Mr. Kato. <laughs> you know, in other words, they are so conditioned by their own language and how things are written. K-A-T-O, yeah, Kato, why not? So even though I said his name is Kato and he said his name is Kato, they will say Kato. So there's a lot of things like that where an experienced person will actually notice how things are said, how things are expressed, how things are pronounced. So attitude, time, and this ability to notice. And I still believe that the biggest impact there is this experience with the language, which brings us to Stephen Krashen's brilliant input hypothesis, which was to me a revelation. I wouldn't say it was quite like reading Stephen Hawkins on evolution, but it was close. And when, when he says that if you can understand the message you are learning, I mean, I think that is in a nutshell. I would go further and say, if you are enjoying the experience of learning the language, you are learning. So the whole experience, I think, uh, is, is, is crucial. And, and again, as I said earlier, if I think back on my learning, uh, I, I mostly I remember these moments when I had this enjoyable experience. For example, with Chinese, I used to listen to these Xiangsheng, you know, comic dialogues. Or I remember when I read my first, huh? Xiangsheng. When I read my first Chinese novel, you know, Luo Tuo Xiangzi by Lao Shu. Wow, I read a novel, and that whole experience of reading that, uh, you know, that sort of resonates. I can remember being in Palm Springs with my wife and I'd go jogging in the morning before we had to go, like my wife likes to golf, I'm less enthusiastic, but jogging around in the sun, listening to I Promessi Sposi, which is the, you know, narrated by this wonderful guy called Il Narratore, who he sits in his little room and records uh, the classics of Italian literature, but you know, and there were other Showa no Kiroko, which I used to, well, I listened to ten times in Japan, the history of a Showa era, and on and on and on, in French, at least in, 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 in uh, as I say, Turgenev, you know, I'd see Yeti or, or, or uh, Anna Karenina in Russian. These are the sort of captivating experiences that I have uh, with the language. Now, in order to enjoy captivate, captivating experiences with the language, you have to deal with meaningful content. And the traditional, you often hear, well, you've got to have 95% of the, of the words. You have to know 95 and this N plus 1, and, which suggests that people can only progress very, very slowly, that they have to have these graded readers and stuff like that. And, and I think that that uh, might have been true in the old days when you had to fight with the dictionary. And I think all of us, and people look at, oh, Steve, you're a good language learner, but Everything that I look up in a dictionary, I forget immediately. Like, no sooner do I close the dictionary than I've forgotten not only the meaning of the word, but that I ever looked it up, that I ever saw it before. You know, and so, or uh, before the age of the uh, computer, I would be reading readers with glossaries. And of course, whatever word I didn't know, half the time wasn't in the glossary. And half the words in the glossary I knew because Obviously, it's impossible for the person who makes this reader up to anticipate which words I know and which words I don't know. So, but today, you know, if, if I look at, at how I like to learn, you know, I want, if I'm going to study a text, uh, obviously, the first little period, I, I, I typically grab myself, you know, teach yourself or colloquial or some starter book, and maybe two, and, and kind of get a, a bit of a sense of the language. But... Fairly quickly, I want to get into something that's interesting, but I want audio with it. I want to hear it. 
If I can hear it a few times, it gives me some momentum when I then go in there and try to read it. Uh, I want to be able to instantly access dictionaries. I want to save these words to a database for later review. I want to save phrases. I want to be able to review them. I want to be able to tag them by different categories, different aspects of the language that are giving me difficulty. I want to highlight some of these words to remind me that I've seen them before. In other words, I want to create a more interactive, more kind of resonating interaction with these texts than, than, than were possible with our traditional uh, readers. So all I've talked about here in my learning process is input. So what about output? You know, I always get this, well, yeah, but what about output? So I was just thinking, you know, with, with regard to output, I call it GPS, grammar, pronunciation, and speaking. GPS. Now, everybody thinks, at least a lot of people think primarily in those terms. And very often you hear people say, well, first you've got to nail down the grammar, get the basics, and then you can, you know, proceed in another language. And you have to nail down the pronunciation at the beginning. You know, and it's very and, and typically I think a lot of learners want to speak at the beginning. They want to have that sense of achievement, you know, that I can say something, you know, in the language. My own experience, and there again I, I tend to agree very much with Stephen Krashen. The grammar, yeah, you need a bit of an overview of how the language functions, you know. Uh, je m'appelle Nyazavut, uh, you know, Ijajmo means that you want to get some sense of how they say some of these things. But I have no expectation when I start into the grammar, that I'm going to remember anything. Uh, or even understand. I mean, some of those explanations in Russian, I mean, aspects of verbs and stuff, you have no idea what you're talking about, and, and the, the explanation has no impact. Uh, and even reviewing tables, which I do, never quite sure what I, what I retain from reviewing the sort of declension tables. But unless you've experienced it, it's very, very difficult. It, to me, it's a bit of putting the cart before the horse. Same with pronunciation. Uh, some people say, oh, you've got to nail that on the pronunciation or your ingrained bad habits. I've never found that to be the case. I've found that if I'll go three months listening and, and resonating stuff that captivates me, I, I start to distinguish the sounds better. And, and you can't reproduce something that you can't hear. So that my feeling again is that if you can get people to focus on comprehension and listening and input, and build up that comprehension and create that enjoyable experience with the language and they're listening to it, it's almost like music, then eventually when they start to speak, they won't have ingrained any, ingrained any bad habits and they'll have an easier time of pronouncing. And similarly with speaking, I think, there's no, to me, there's no hard and fast rule. Most of my languages have been learned in places where the language wasn't spoken and so therefore I've been in no hurry to speak. However, when I lived in Japan, for example, Again, I didn't go to school, but I, I was doing a lot of listening and reading. I was also using the language. So I think, although my major emphasis, even in Japan, was listening and reading to material that was of interest to me. That's where I spent most of my time. But where I had an opportunity to use the language, of course, I would, I would try to use it. So I think speaking the language is more a matter of, of the opportunity or the need that a person might, might have, but I don't, and, or the desire of the person to speak. But I think uh, it can be quite stressful. Uh, because it's stressful to speak when you don't understand. And, uh, you know, I often hear people say, well, you know, a lot of people can read and can understand, but they can't speak. But when you really explore, I have found, for example, here in Vancouver, Chinese people say, well, we can read, you know, we Chinese, we can read, but we can't uh, speak. Oh, I say, you can read. So do you read novels? No. Like, what can you read? They can read a short um, article in the newspaper. But that, to me, you, if you're serious, I tell them here, I often meet with Chinese immigrants, and I say, you've got to get to where you can read a novel. Like, to me, when I read uh, The Rickshaw Boy, the Lotus Xianzi, that was a major sort of milestone in my Chinese learning. You have to get to that level, in my opinion, mm -hmm. uh, of comprehension. Uh, because I find that a lot of people who say they understand the language, uh, I mean, I lived in Japan for nine years. I did business with the Japanese people, and very often I would just switch to Japanese because I could sense that they couldn't really understand what I was saying. When you came to important issues, the comprehension wasn't there. And uh, I don't mind someone who stumbles in speaking if they understand what I'm saying. And I also don't mind stumbling when I speak as long as I can understand 
what the other person is saying. So my approach to, quote, a GPS is that it can be delayed, and it depends on circumstances and, and needs and, and so forth and so on. Uh, my emphasis is very much, as with Stephen Krashen, on, uh, on input. But I, I do like some structure. And I have found that, uh, for example, when I studied Romanian, I went to Odesk, which is a, an outsourcing website on the internet, and I wrote up like 200 sentences in English. Uh, why? Because, therefore, if, you know, different tenses, different concepts, uh, and I wanted example sentences of each of them, had someone uh, basically translated into Romanian and recorded for me. Uh, I sometimes will, you know, when I buy books, uh, language books, um, I will never do the grammar drills. Like, I just totally <laughs> resent, refuse, but I will look at the answers. Because to me, it's often useful to review the patterns. And at some level, it helps to train you in some of the patterns that you're going to encounter in your listening and reading. It helps you notice them better. And when you notice them better, they start to become habits. And, and also, I have found that as an independent learner, it's, it's useful to have some tasks that you can just knock off so that you have the feeling that you did something. Because very often, if you're just learning or reading and enjoying the language, sometimes you're not sure you've, you've achieved anything. Uh, and that's why at Link, for example, uh, we have, uh, you know, we keep statistics of how many words you've read, how many words you've saved, so that people get that sense that they're doing something. Because I think we require I think we require an ability to explore, but we also like to have some repetitive tasks that we could knock off to get a sense of achievement. Uh, so I'm not, in, not totally just input. I think there needs to be a certain amount of structure, even though we're not sure, uh, I'm not sure, uh, how much I'm retaining uh, of, of this sort of deliberate study of patterns. But I kind of think it helps me notice things. So that's sort of my experience, my experience of language learning. And uh, I think it relates back to Dr. Hager's, uh, uh, Lyman Hager's three principles. In other words, if we, if we can achieve for ourselves or for um, learners an enjoyable experience of learning the language, that creates, first of all, emotionally, I think we know enough about the brain to know that if the brain is happy, the brain is going to learn, whereas the brain, if the brain is fighting it, it's not going to learn. Uh, if we have an enjoyable experience, we will put in the time because the learning becomes its own reward. We don't begrudge the time we're spending with the language because we're enjoying the process. So therefore, if we can create an enjoyable experience, we will ensure that enough time is spent. And I think if we are enjoying the language and enjoying the experience, we naturally start to notice because we're interested in noticing. So that I, I, I talk about language learning as an experiential um, process and, and perhaps the role of the teacher. And I sense from my interaction with Donald and his students that he's that kind of a teacher. If you can create through enthusiasm, if you can create the sense of enjoyment, a stimulus, encouragement, guidance, and, and make the learning of language an enjoyable experience. Now, that's a big if, because it depends on students who have other interests and so forth. Then I think the rest, the rest will come. So that's kind of my brief sort of presentation that I have prepared. And if you want, I, I could open it up to questions, or I can uh, give a brief overview of Link, or whatever people want to do. But I, this is my, the prepared portion of my presentation. I, I think, oh, here. I always learn the best when I ask a lot of questions. So I'm going to ask the audience, everybody, to come up and ask a lot of questions to start. If they want. <laughs> Anybody? I'll do it. Okay. <laughs> yes. Yes, right here. Okay. Steve with Steve. Yeah. <laughs> so look, Steve. <clears throat> Hi, Steve. Steve. Yeah, well, you know, I'm, I'm really upset with what you said. You didn't quote my name enough. <laughs> you didn't mention my work. I mean, all this time we've been buddies, and, you know, you don't give me any credit. Uh, a couple of, uh, <clears throat> oh gosh, ladies and gentlemen, we have so much to learn from these <coughs> polyglots who have actually been there. Um, this is amazing what I've learned from Steve Kaufman. Um, and the advantage that you have 
is that you're not a professional in the field, which means you're talking to real people. You're selling lumber and doing negotiations and getting all this input. It's fabulous. So thank you for the uh, insights and your continuing uh, contributions. It's great. Having said that, here we go. Um, noticing. Here, I think that your pattern of mostly acquisition with a little bit of conscious learning and analysis thrown in is absolutely perfect for a situation such as the one here in St. Andrews where students are expected to have some conscious knowledge of the language and the students who come in here are a lot of them are like you and me who have a curiosity about language and I think that the grammar that we sometimes review is a lot of it is language appreciation that satisfies curiosity and I'm exactly like you I still haven't recovered from studying grammar at the university from Chomsky all these things and if people want to talk about the subjunctive I'm all there you know so I think that's a big part of it and noticing gives us pleasure however as I'm sure you'll agree there are limits you can't notice everything and the problem is that there is a faction of uh, my critics who are only about 95 percent of the professors who think that you have to notice everything that noticing is an absolute prerequisite which is driving everybody crazy because it means you have to consciously learn everything so I think a lot of the value of noticing of getting a look at the grammar and believe me I do it exactly the way you do exactly what you do I do too um, it's not may not be for everybody and in fact what I lectured on today here is the idea that optimal language acquisition and here's what I want to ask you about your experience I'm really curious optimal language acquisition happens when the input is so interesting you temporarily forget it's in another language and you're completely swept away by the person you're talking to or the book and I'd like to ask you how often this happens to you as a polyglot interacting with other people where you're completely absorbed it's no longer Putunghua, it's no longer Japanese, it's just you interacting with a book or a person. You know, uh, first of all, I, I shouldn't have mentioned a prop, but I realize that the, you're with your adepts, so I need But yeah, I can right, assure exactly. you that when I read what you had to say, it was absolutely, and it was more than my experience. It, it, it not only just provided it, Pointed out other other directions as well. I hadn't realized, for example, that uh, writing correction didn't do much, and that the whole bunch of stuff like that that you had not only intuitively sensed but also through research demonstrated to be the case, and which ran counter to to all of. Uh, I mean, I can't remember all the stuff that I've underlined in the books that I have read, which absolutely ring true. And what you have just said right now rings one hundred percent true. One of the reasons I'm having trouble with Korean is that I haven't found that captivating content. When I did, for example, Czech, if anyone ever takes on Czech, they have stuff on Czech radio. They have this Tolki Chesko Minulosti, which is fabulous stuff on Czech history. Uh, you know, 14th century, 15th century, you name it. Russian, of course, you got audiobooks, then you got Ekama Sui, where you can get into all of the po politics of today's Russia. Uh, Ukrainian, which, because I'm following the events of Ukraine. But, you know, in, in Korean, I haven't found, and you described it as, but basically you talk about meaningful and comprehensible input. I found a very good podcast, uh, which I actually paid someone to transcribe for me so I could import it. It's just a tad too difficult. Yeah. Uh, I need something. I don't want silly stuff. Like there's, uh, there's tons of silly stuff. Oh, you know, oh, how are you? We're happy. We're blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I can't listen to that stuff. And yet this... Uh, this uh, podcast, the Kim Yong Ha, is, a, is a, a, a Korean writer, and he has this wonderful series on world literature. And as long as he's talking, I can understand. But when he narrates from the book, Yukio Mishima translated into Korean, I can't follow what he's, what he's talking about. So I'm saying, yes, absolutely, you need captivating content, high resonance content. And I often equate it to, you know, I used to have a dog, a very strong dog, and he'd go chasing birds, and he'd go through the bramble bushes, like he'd come out the other side, he'd just pouring blood, but he was just going after that bird, and it's the same, like if it's captivating content, 
I don't mind a high percentage of unknown words. Exactly. I don't mind difficulty, exactly. and, and, but I'll just keep plugging away at it. Whereas if it's of no interest to me, then after a while you just, ah. You can't learn out of duty. Uh, let, I, let I feel, me, yeah. Let me ahead. restate what you said and add some terminology, then I can get credit for all of it. Um, <laughs> the word we're looking for that I've been using is compelling input. Very close to Chinsek Mahali's idea of flow. And Absolutely. to restate what you said, the more compelling the input, the more you can tolerate noise in the data. Absolutely. In the input. The more you can tolerate uh, unknown words, and the more you can tolerate the fact that you don't fully understand it. Exactly. That it remains fuzzy. It doesn't bother me. I don't have to nail it down. And, and there, a very interesting person is uh, Ruben Alves. I don't know if you're familiar with him. Brazilian educator. Yeah. Ruben Alves. And uh, he, sir, he made two points. One, he said, and, and I personally hate when the teacher asks me to analyze a text that I have read and to explain the meaning. I don't mind being asked, what did I think of it? But when I'm asked to explain the meaning, well, I may have a meaning that's different from what the teacher interprets as the meaning. Mine may even be wrong. Mine may even change six months later when I understand more, but it's my understanding of what I read, and I don't mind that being fuzzy. As, I, as long as I'm in that flow, I say, wow, look at me, I'm, I'm reading Tolstoy. I didn't quite understand it, but who cares? I kind of halfway understood it, but it's still satisfying to me, and it's <laughs> the content. I'll just tell you my story. I'm so proud of myself. I just finished reading Zorro in Spanish. Spanish oh, okay. I'm not really good at, but it was exciting, and I could tolerate a lot of noise because it was so well written. Same thing. Same thing. Thank Same you. Thing. Great. Okay. It, it doesn't even have to be well written. All it has to do is motivate you. That's true. For whatever reason. <laughs> That's true. Okay. All right. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. So. I'll ask a question. Yes, I yes, yes. This is my uh, sister, Susan. This is very fascinating. I, I, hi. I'm not a teacher. I'm okay. A, I'm a mother. <laughs> and uh, my son's taking Spanish, and he has no interest because... He's being taught grammar, and he just doesn't, he's, he's not motivated to learn. But um, that's not really my question. It was just um, my preamble. Um, what is your day like? What do you do? I mean, to me, it's fascinating that someone could learn that many languages. Um, how, what is you, how do you spend your days? Are you constantly reading, constantly um, learning? Well, what is constantly, but you know, you know I, I would say an hour or two, depending on the day. Um, so, I mean, if I say, okay, uh, last little while, okay, my wife and I bought a house in Palm Springs. So we went down there. So most of the time was uh, we had to uh, deal with whatever we had to do and buy furniture and stuff like that. And then she likes to play golf, so I went to play golf. But uh, if I'm doing chores around the house, I'm listening to Korean. Although, because I, I am following the events in Ukraine. I'll also listen to some Russian Ukraine. Uh, I'll always have on my iPad. Oh, and then I have to fly to Edmonton for business meeting. He went back to Vancouver. So if I'm on the plane, a plane's a great time because you're stuck for six hours or three hours or whatever it is. So I'm sitting there and I'm reading stuff in uh, on my uh, on my iLink, you know, link, and I'm looking up the words that I looked up before. Um, if I if I go jogging, if I uh, I'm in the car, I'm listening. So a lot of it is actually dead time. If I have dedicated language learning time, which is, I would say, maybe 30%, 20%, then I'll read. Like I, I would never sit down and listen. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I don't, I'm not a big fan of watching movies. Because where I have, for example, in, in the case of Chinese, if I listen to, uh, you know, the Sangwa Yangi, which is uh, the Romance of the Three Kingdoms, when I listen to this uh, narrator tell it in the traditional narration, it's so much richer than, and I bought this the, the, uh, video when I was in Beijing, and I watched it, and I was, it was like, there's hardly any words. So to, to me, I would say, uh, if I couldn't, if it weren't for the MP3 player, the ability to listen when doing all kinds of different tasks, and then 
coupled with you know the ability then to go and mine that text for words and phrases, review it, read it, and then you go back and listen, listen, listen. So given that you can use a lot of dead time, I, I would think the dedicated study time might be half an hour to an hour a day, and the rest of it is just taking advantage of opportunities to listen. And I don't have much opportunity to speak. Uh, I simply don't. I can't rearrange my life to join every Korean, Russian, Ukrainian social media. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's very okay. interesting. It's very, I, I very have inspiring. A, I have a student. His name is Samir, and he's actually an advisee of mine, and he just walked in. Uh -huh. So his question, you might have already talked about it, but it's always good to hear it again. He has a question for you. Uh -huh. Go ahead. <laughs> Hi. Um, Hi, Samir. Um, I... I heard you when I was outside of the door, you talked about having being interested in the language to be able to learn it. But what other keys, what, what, what other core important things do you find to learn a language independently? So say if someone to do, someone wants to do that independently on their own, what else besides being interested in it might they need? Well, I think... You have to be confident. A lot of people who have never achieved a level of fluency in a second language don't think they can do it. So you have to be confident you can do it. You have to be curious and interested. I mean, if you are those things, then the discipline, the, the ability to stay with the task will come. So I, I think those are... Uh, you know, those attitudinal things. You, you want to do it, you like the language, and you think you can achieve it. That would be my answer. I don't know if that satisfies your... I got it. ...question or not. <laughs> Hello. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, we're good. Um, there's another student of mine over here. His name is Jordan Hamilton, and she has a question for you. you got to get close, though, and ask. Hi. Hi. Um, I have a question um, just for, I guess it's kind of specific to me, but not really. Um, I struggle with like different learning disabilities, and so I can sort of pick up the patterns, but I have a, tr I have a lot of trouble mem like remembering them, and it often takes a while for it to like come back into my head, and just sort of any advice you could offer on, um, or anything you've sort of encountered as far as learning disabilities and understanding or learning a language. That's you know, I have no experience with the issue of rediscovery. When it comes to memory, um, I find that most of the words that I learn, I forget. And uh, I don't know whether I forget more than you or less than you, I have no idea. But, but uh, we forget. And there is an interesting, I, maybe uh, Professor Krashen is familiar with this, there's an interesting series of videos by a professor at UCLA uh, whose name is Robert Bjork. And he talks about interleaved learning. So you can look up in YouTube, you can look up Robert Bjork, B-J-O-R-K. And he points out that where we learn and forget, learn and forget, that actually is stronger. And he's a cognitive scientist, like he's a neuroscientist of some kind. And so the whole process of learning and forgetting, learning and forgetting, he's actually very good for learning. And, and, and that if you just sit yourself down in front of a list of words, and you tell yourself, I'm going to learn this, and you just sit there and sit there and try and pound it into your head, that is actually not very efficient. <laughs> not very efficient. And the likelihood is, at least in my experience, maybe 20% of those I'm going to learn, and the other 80%, it doesn't matter how much time I spend, I'm not going to learn them. They're not going to stay with me. But they did enter your brain at some point. And if you encounter them again and encounter them again, learn them, forget them, learn them, forget them, that actually is a very, it expands your brain. So that's a good thing. So the fact that you learn and forget is not a problem. It, there, there's no race here. Whether you, whether you remember word X, uh, you know, the first time around, or two months later, or six months later, it doesn't matter. And, and you might have it for a while and lose it again. None of that matters. All that really matters is that, this, as Dr. Greg, Professor Krashen said, this is an engagement with compelling content. So if you're enjoying the experience, 
and you're enjoying listening and reading, and you're enjoying interacting, and there again, not being too hard on yourself, like there's certain things you didn't understand, and maybe you, like it happens to me, I understood before, and now I don't understand it. Or I was able to cert say certain things very well one evening, and then the next evening I'm not. You just, you know, roll with the punches. Just try to enjoy the process, and things will click in when they click in. But the fact that you learn and forget is not a bad thing. Thank but you. I'm not an expert on learning disability, so that's all I <laughs> Thank you. Hi, my name is Wu Ji, and yeah. I'm a Chinese teacher. I want to ask you, yes. how, how do you choose your, I mean, what materials of reading do you choose in the beginning of learning Chinese, and then what materials do you choose later on? Okay, if I go back to when I studied Chinese, which is now, you know, 1968, how many years ago was that? That's a lot of years. <laughs> Uh, we had the Yale and China series in those days, so we began with a thing called Chinese Dialogues, where they had no characters. It was only, in those days, the Wade Giles opinion, with a lot of audio, a lot of audio. And I remember thinking in those days that, that the audio was so fast that they must be doing that deliberately to torture us. <laughs> of course, subsequently I realized that, that it wasn't that fast at all, but we stuck with it, we stuck with it, pinyin and audio, that was maybe, I don't know, a month, I can't remember. Hmm. Then we went to a thing called, uh, and of course Chinese is the one language, not the only, but because of the characters, uh, you know, graded readers become really important in Chinese. Yeah, so that's why I, I'm asking you this question. <laughs> and so we then had a thing called... Yeah, so then, so, okay. so the next thing they had, they, have a, okay. they had a geography of China. Oh, I should point out that the way I set characters, okay? Let, let me just finish with my answer. Me, so then. I had a system, which I can explain to you later, about how I learned characters. But then, yeah, pardon? So the next text we, we went to is called 20 Lectures. We, Sorry. We, we missed all the points you, 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 you just told us, because the, the signal is not good, so. Oh, oh how about now? Uh, it's better. Okay. Yeah. Start again. Yeah. The first, the first month. Can you hear me now? Yeah. First month, I listened to. We, we focused on audio only and pinion. Mm -hmm. And we listened and listened and listened. It sounded very fast to us, but it got us familiar to the sounds to some extent. Then the first. And, and then I studied characters, I started studying characters on my own, and I, I can explain later what I did. I had flash card. Are you good? Yes. 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 I wonder if my, uh, if I go closer to the, uh, it's the internet, it's not the... Yeah, but I'm going to try and move over to, closer to the router. Okay. And oh. oh. <laughs> All right. How's that? Is that better? Uh, yeah. See, for yeah. now, for now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> over there. Okay. Nice house. How are we doing? Yeah. <laughs> I'll let you look at the ocean here. Okay. Pacific Ocean here in Vancouver. <laughs> we go swimming. Oh, wow. All right. It's a little bit chilly. Now, is that better? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So far. So, so far. All right. So, um, when I um, started in Chinese, as I say, we, it was audio and pinyin. Mm -hmm. After a month, we started. Oh, connection lost. Damn it. <laughs> we can still hear you. Okay. Uh, so, then the first book I read was called. Um, Chinese geography, and it was written at a level of 300 characters, Yale and China. 
The next thing was an excellent book. Now, granted, we started in traditional characters. And there was a book called Zhongguo Wenhua Arshijia, 20 Lectures in Chinese Culture. Excellent book. And by the end of that, uh, you know, we had enough uh, characters, and we had some exposure to Chinese history and to even modern politics. Uh, and then there was a book called Intermediate Reader in Chinese, and I can give you the details. A phenomenal book, and and they focused on patterns. Like you'd have a text, and you were now by this time we were into authentic texts and a large vocabulary list for each lesson, and then the key patterns. And occasionally they would have explanations of grammar with triangles and stuff. I couldn't understand what they were talking about. I would just focus on the patterns, you know. In Chinese they say it this way. Okay, that's a pattern. I can, you know, I can identify that as a pattern. Whatever words they used to describe that was totally lost on me. So that, and once I had finished this intermediate reader, basically anything was open to me. I had enough, and there were so many readers in those days. This is before the, the time of the, uh, you know, of the uh, internet. And uh, readings in Chinese literature, readings in Chinese communist literature, readings in this, that, and the other, all with a glossary. So that's, uh, now, nowadays, in fact, I can show you something. Uh, let me just see. I'm going to try and share the screen. Share screen. And uh, start. And uh, whoops, let's go to uh, here. Oh, yeah. So here's, for example, now if you click your link, of course, you can access anything because we have, uh, you can look up, you know, if it's Guang Gao, you can look it up and you immediately get. Um, you know, the, 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 uh, the meaning, and then you can save it to your database. This was not available to me when I was studying, where I would have to deal with readers that had uh, uh, glossaries. And so I would regularly go down to uh, the bookstore, and I'm just going to stop this now, just a second. I'm turning to me. I have to go to the bookstore and look for books. But nowadays, the equivalent of me going to the bookstore to look for new readers, I was in Hong Kong at the time, is that people can go on the internet and find stuff. So okay. that's Thank you. a bit of a long-winded answer, but that's, that's what I did anyway. Thank you. Thank you. So everybody is hooked up to Wi-Fi, and they really want to play around with your site. So... Um, could I do something, though, because it, it might be a little confusing. I would like to go into a couple of languages, okay. a shared screen, and just do a few things, just to give people a bit of an idea. Perfect. That's what they want. Yeah, perfect. Okay. So let's try the shared screen again. I'm not great at all this stuff, but... Uh, okay, start. And we're going to go over here. So let's go to... I've prepared a few. Let's go to Spanish. I believe this is Spanish, okay? So if you're in link... Actually, you begin on a thing called the Learn page. So we'll go to the Learn page. And uh, notice that, that uh, here you can choose your language, right? Mm -hmm. You're all, to ask me if I'm not coming through or whatever. So you can choose whatever language you want to learn here. But I happen to have selected Spanish. And I'm going to open this. Is, all of our lessons are in courses. And most of our lessons are provided by our members. And in this case, we had a fellow in Barcelona who was learning English, but he developed a series of lessons called Puntos de Vista. So I'm going to begin, but there are all kinds of lessons and of different levels, like frases básicas en español, whatever, and so forth. But let's go to Puntos de Vista. So uh, now, right away, you see that I have no new words in this lesson. Every word in here is known to me. So let's look down, just to show you, go down here, here, for example. Uh, is that a good one? Yeah, El vacío bajo mis pies. Okay, part five. Versión en futuro. So what he's done, he has created a series of, of lessons, uh, all in different tenses. Because, obviously in Spanish, 
Tense is a major problem. Not a problem, but it's a challenge. So let's just first play the music. So here's an example, a good example. So, the same story is available in present, third, whatever. And if there's a word that we don't understand, we just click on it and we will see the meaning. And you'll see a little number here because to get the meaning, we typically have to go to a dictionary, but most of these languages, people have already been there before, and you can see which have been the most popular definitions chosen from a dictionary. And you can, you can also choose whichever dictionary you want. So if you like this, if you like raise or I will raise, you just click on it. And you've now captured this into your database. Uh, you've captured some example phrases of this word in use which is very good to review. I like examples, okay? And immediately, because Levantare appears again, it's highlighted in yellow. Uh, anytime you um, save a word, like perdonarán, will forgive, you select that, it's now in yellow. And that tells you that you have seen that word before. And so you go down the lesson, uh, selecting all of the words that you don't know. Obviously, when you begin, all words are blue. Uh, as you progress, for example, if I were to say that I know all the other words in this lesson, I just go, I know all remaining blue words. I click on that, and it tells me that I have earned some coins towards my icon. It tells me that I've added 11 known words, and uh, I can then go to the next lesson if I want, uh, or next, I've added X number of words to my known words total. Now, there's, I, I can't get in, there's so much stuff, I can't get into all of the detail, but the principle is that you are saving these words to a database where you can then go and, and flashcard them. Uh, on the flashcard, you have, uh, you know, text-to-speech to remind you of, of how these words are pronounced. There's the captured phrase. And also on the, on the flashcard, you can change the status as you become better at the language. Some people put the... Um, the meaning on the back of the flashcard. I don't. Like, when I study in any language, I just want to go through the flashcards as fast as possible. I don't want to try and force my brain to remember because I don't think it does much for me. I just treat the flashcards as an excuse, as, as a sort of exposure and, and a chance to repeat things and, and hopefully get better at noticing. And then I will also change the status as I, as I learn, you know, I go from new to can't remember to not sure and then no, okay? So let me just start with that. Are there any questions at this point? Yeah, I want to tell you that I think the most powerful thing on the site is that you have stories in there that are interesting and they're comprehensible because you can look stuff up and then, but then you are lining up text with the sound of the voice. And to me, that's awesome. And then um, I even tell my students this now because we just started using this site. I actually have them um, uh, when they're clean, just like you said, like if you're going to clean your room, I tell them when you're cleaning the room, that's how you can do your homework tonight. Like you read, the, you read the thing two or three times and if you don't have time to finish it while you're cleaning your room for room inspection, you can be listening to it because it's something that you understand now. Exactly. And I, what I tend to do is, is um, most of what I study now in, say, Russian or Korean is no longer in our library. It's stuff that I find on the internet and bring in. But if it's an inter and typically I look for stuff with audio and text. Yeah. And then yeah. I kind of mine it. Uh, I like to call it sort of mining it. Um, now, let me just see what's going on here. Did I, how did I... Uh... Yeah, get me off the screen, man. <laughs> <laughs> What's happening now? You, I'm like you have me. Oh, good. You're back to the. You're, you're back. So, you're back on. Now you have this. The, you're back up there with the text and this and everything. And so, so if I go to the next lesson, I like to mine this thing, save words and phrases, review them a bit in flashcards, and then, and then I go and listen. So yeah. then the major activity is downloading it and listening it, as you said, listening to it, yeah. as you say, well, I'm I'm doing other tasks. Yeah. The other thing is too is that you have that. I noticed that, that you have like a downloading feature, so you can put it on your MP3 player or whatever, or your iPhone or whatever. 
Exactly. That's, I think that's the major activity. Download the audio, uh, and uh, you can print it, of course. Um, but it's the biggest time is, is spent listening. Yeah. I have to tell you, I'm, I'm yeah. doing that in French right now. In French right now, I have this, there's this guy I'm listening to who is, uh, he's this really in compelling right-wing um, uh, 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 evangelist. Oh, yeah. And he just, I mean, it's just so much fun to listen to this guy rant and rave. And um, that's, how I, uh, that's how I keep my contact time with French right now. I'm, I'm on... He has 239 videos so far, and I've listened to 54 of them. It's just, it's great. <laughs> okay, I, I think, uh, you know, I don't want to go, it's, it, I think it can be, get a bit tedious to go through the details of Link. If, you, if there are some specific questions, I could answer them. Or do you want me to continue clicking through it, or what, what, what would you no, like I, to do? I have a question about yeah. importing. Yes. Oh, she actually, there's someone that has a question. Why don't you come all the way around here and ask? <clears throat> so, uh, my question is, I so a lot of the definitions and things are put in by users. So, is this like a great global effort to put this all together? No, the definitions, they come from dictionaries. So, okay. just show you, no, no, they have. But they choose uh, uh, an appropriate, and, and we call it, by the way, we call it a hint. Because okay. we believe that, uh, and I'll show you how that works. We believe that uh, dictionary definition is just the beginning of your understanding of, of that word and how it's used. And, and uh, now, just a second, where did my screen share go to? Hmm, maybe he's here. Hold it. There, are you looking at the screen now? Yeah. So if we go, let's say that even a word that, that, uh, that you had already considered to be, anything that's white is something that you had considered to be uh, known. But you can always go and save it again, and the statistics track it. So if you want to search the dictionary here, uh, you can choose what you want to use as a dictionary. Word reference, whoops. You know, dictionary dot dic dot cc, Google Translate, Lingui, Spanish Grammar Database, you know, you name it. And people ask us to add dictionaries. And if people are German speakers or French speakers or Chinese speakers, we can put on a dictionary that uh, converts into their language uh, or a, uh, you know, a monolingual dictionary, whatever they want. What happens is as people select certain dictionary definitions, the system uh, caches that. So that you don't have to go off to uh, word reference or somewhere. That it's actually cached in the system. That makes it faster. And also, uh, we can see the ones that have been selected most often okay. for that okay. word. Okay. okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Hello. Yes. Um, I just have a question about uh, how things are organized in the site. So okay. we teach at a middle school, and a lot of our students have some trouble, you know, keeping their things organized on the computer. You know, all of their Word documents for their English papers are all titled, untitled, and none of them are in a folder, and they're always losing things. And just wondering what the site might look like for a middle school boy um, when he's he's logging on and. He's, is, is there a folder where all of the courses are going to be saved and it's going to be kind of um, uh, sort of self-explanatory how he's going to walk through the site and, and to find things? Yeah, it's hard for me to say. Um, if I look at right now, for example, I'm doing Ukraine. So when I go in there, I see the last courses that I have been learning from. So those, these, whatever I have opened recently, I've opened something in this Vidat uh, Ukraini, Ukrainski Krisis. These are some of the courses that I've looked at. So, and uh, if I open that, I'll see the most recent lessons that I have studied. This one here, I'm down to zero new words, and this one here, obviously, I haven't started. So you'll see. Uh, can also go to uh, tasks, and there you'll see the last three lessons that you were studying. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that a student needs a lot of direction. Like, I'm a motivated adult. 
A student would have to be directed. And what we're talking about with Donald is that he would direct his students to certain specific content, mm -hmm. and uh, some of which might be under copyright, in which case we wouldn't share it with uh, the broader link community. But my own, in my case, I tend to go to the task list, which is a shortcut. Uh, I might go there to import a lesson, to review vocabulary. I tend to go to the task list quite often because, um, you know, I forget what I was last studying, and there you'll typically see the last three lessons that, uh, that you've been studying. Okay, and if you open, so here, for example, uh, we open this, uh, these are the individual lessons within this uh, collection. And this collection, by the way, is a, a Ukrainian girl in Vancouver who uh, found uh, some material on famous figures in Ukrainian history, and she records it herself and puts it up here. So that's okay. how we get a lot of our material. Okay. Great. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Anybody? Anybody? Okay, um, I have a question. Um, I had a few questions. I'll ask them again. Some of you, you've already answered them for me, but okay. for example, um, remember when I was asking you about, um, hey, could you do me a favor? I don't like looking at myself. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, uh, I am uh, not swift enough, but whenever we <laughs> talk, I find a place where yeah, it's stop yeah, sharing yeah. screen yeah. and so yeah. No, um, you, you answered some of my questions like uh, we, when we Skyped and, and you're, is Alex your son? The Alex, guy? Oh, no, Mark is my son. Okay, so Alex is the techie guy who like immediately the next day, no, he's not. Yeah, he's more techie. Yeah, 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 he's not the programmer, but he understands things. The yeah. ne very next day, he created groups for me for all um, of my students in each section. And right. I was able to go in and actually see like how much activity they were doing, which was really cool. And, um, and I know, which, what I thought was really neat is a couple of them were using um, other languages that they were um, interested in. I was right. able to see that. So, because I could see the languages. And so, the, what I'm interested in is, is like some of the nuts and bolts. Like, if I want to. If I want to, um, I, I have to pay for this. Like I had to pay for this with my own money and then get reimbursed. I want to be able to have it so that the school can charge the kids and like send you a check or something or um, credit card, and then it's done for the year. We don't have to worry about each month. Like that uh, is doable. I spoke to Mark. Uh, you can have a, a one-shot payment for the year for however many students. Yeah. Um, there was another question you had about whether uh, we can prevent them from sharing copyrighted material. Yes, if yes. accidentally gave it a rose, yes, we will do that. Yes, yes. Uh, and then also some way of tracking uh, what they're doing and their achievements. Yes. Maybe it would be worthwhile for me now just to go over some of that, some of okay. the uh, functionality that's built into the system that enables you to uh, basically follow what they're doing. Okay. Okay, so let me just, again, uh, when I get out of screen share again, your face may be featured there for a couple oh, okay. of seconds. Well, I struggle to uh, uh, change back into the other mode here, but I'm going to go to share screen okay. and start, and then I'm going to get rid of that. And so uh, here, now over here we have this, uh, now let's just move this guy out of the way here. So over here we have, you can either look at an avatar and people students earn coins with which they can buy. First of all, their avatar grows as they learn more, and they can buy these cultural icons, which in the case, and Ukrainian is not a, um, not a uh, supported language, so we'll go to Spanish. And of course, I'm not active in Spanish, so that's not a good example. We'll go back to Ukraine. This is what happens when you start out. This is your little avatar. And I got a rotten apple on top, and I haven't done much. In Spanish, because it's not language that I'm learning on the site. Uh -huh. But uh, in Ukrainian, oh, you know what? We'll go to Russian. Well, I haven't read Korean. <laughs> Korean, all right? So, yeah, Korean is probably the best example. So, Korean here, uh, uh, you have an avatar. So, my uh, avatar is fully grown in Korean because I've been active. I don't have a rotten apple, and I picked a bunch of cultural icons. Uh, now, this is based on, on my activity level. Now, last seven days, last little while I've been busy down in Palm Springs, haven't done much. But if I look at, let's say, the last three months. So, 
I have increased my known words total by this much. I have created this many links, 1,500. That means I have deliberately saved 1,553 words and phrases that are highlighted in yellow on my screen that I regularly see that remind me that I've been trying to learn them. The links learned, I don't do much. Like some people like to review their flashcards and kind of nail them down, and I don't. I just let them sit there as uh -huh. in, in, you know, work in progress, highlighted in yellow. I see them, I'm reminded, so that's not so good. 3.5 hours of listening, that's not accurate, but I don't record all my listening uh -huh. because it's not recorded. It's only recorded if I listen on the site, but most of my listening is away from the site. Yes, so yes. Recorded. And I have read 17,000 words in the last three months. If I look at the last six months, then I've learned almost, I've read 60,000 words. Most of that I've also listened to at least once on, on my uh, mini disc player. And I've created, I've saved 5,476. So, and there is an activity score, which is a composite. So that um, I think that as a teacher, if you had 25 people you were following, like what I would do is I would say, your activity score has to be maintained at a minimum of such and such. And you have to meet your targets. Now, yeah. I haven't met my known words target, but I've exceeded my links created target. Yeah. Well, that part would be my fault. I wouldn't give them a minimum. That part's my fault. If my stuff is so boring that I can't get them to do a certain level, then that's my fault. So I wouldn't really do that. Okay. So, and one of the, they do receive, so in addition to the, the avatar, there's also a badge which tells you how many words you know. Mm -hmm. So in Korean, I know theoretically 31,000 words. So those are some of the, uh, the ways in which we track their activity level and, uh, and we track uh, what they know. Yep. Okay. Let me oh, know. yeah, yeah. There's another person coming over to question. What's your name? I'm sorry. Elizabeth, Elizabeth is coming over. Okay, and stop sharing screen. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hi, how are you? Hi, thank you. Okay, um, I have a question about collocations, how you deal with collocations, um, phrasal verbs, um, uh, what else? Um, it, word forms um, for for teaching. In other words, do you do you um, outline or highlight um, collocations so that people can learn those, or is it individual words? Okay, that's a good question. Let me just try to get back into my shared screen mode here. Uh, here we are. Not very swift. Now you're not talking about English. You're talking about foreign languages or English. But we also have English. If you have F ESL students, just in general, yeah. Uh, but English would be great, but because that's what uh, I teach. But yeah, well, we have. If you're teaching ESL or even English, uh, in terms of uh, uh, now, let me just see. Where are we? How are we doing there? Is that it? Yeah. Okay. So let's go to, for example, Spanish. Uh, you know, bear in mind that that link is a resource. Link it cannot replace a whole range of other a learning and teaching activities that take place in the classroom or explanations that are in a grammar book, it's a resource. But if we are studying, for example, let's say if we go back to our friend here, or let's, there we go, here, let's go to this guy. So, here, this is intermediate. So, if I say, if I say, just a second. If I say this word, because I don't know what it is, uh, sometimes, well, not in that case. Ah, so, una vez, here's vez, right? Una vez más. So the system will sometimes save a phrase that, and it'll save it if someone else saved it. So somebody who was learning the word vez, like time, saw una vez más and thought, that's an interesting, call it collocation. That's an interesting phrase I'd like to have. So then they will save it. So anytime anyone has saved um, a phrase related to, um, to a particular word, then that will be saved, and I think that would correspond to a, um, a collocation. But it does rely on someone else. But you can also, for example, um, if you, uh, you know, 
you might think this is an interesting phrase. So you save it. All right. And in terms of translating phrases, we rely on Google Translate because there's no dictionary that's going to translate a phrase. But once you've saved it, anybody else in the system who saves the word gustaría is going to see the phrase that you have saved. So over time, with enough people participating in the system and saving, in a sense, collocations, in other words, words that, that belong together that somebody wants to learn as a phrase, other people will see those and may be inclined to save them as well. So that's really the only way we deal with, with that. You can, and the other thing you can do, if you save this uh, and you think this is an interesting, uh, you can put a tag on it so that later on, for example, you might want to save phrasal verbs with get. So every time you see a phrasal verb with get in it, you save the whole phrase and you call it, you know, I'm not going to mess up my Spanish, but you would give it the name get. So that if you go now to your... Um, you know, if you will go to your vocabulary area, you know, and bear in mind that I'm not uh, currently studying Spanish, but, uh, you know, for example, I might have saved, um, uh, I might have created a tag called modal, but I haven't done any, but, you know, the idea is that you would create a tag for something, you know. Okay. Maybe you're having trouble with the feminine, or you're having trouble with with the third person singular of the past tense, or with modal verbs, or with uh, you know useful collocations or phrasal verbs, you would just save those phrases and tag them, and then you can go to your um, vocabulary area where you can review these now in uh, you can review them in cards, in flashcards, closed tests, dictation, where this will be read out in a in a text to speech, and you've got to be able to type it out, there's multiple choice. So once you've created these lists, there's a variety of ways that you can review them. So, so we don't introduce. Now, if, if just as one of our learners created these lessons on tense, if, if a teacher wants to create a lesson around certain phrasal verbs and put, um, put uh, you know, notes, because we do have a notes section, you know, if you go back to the lesson here, um, there are, uh, there can be notes, you see, so in this case there aren't, but you have the opportunity to put notes in as well. So that the, the, le the nature, the degree of explanation in the lesson is totally dependent on the person who the lesson. We are not lesson creators. Our members create lessons. Okay. Great. Thank All you right. so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Now i got to remember how I got out of this. <laughs> Uh, hold it down, don't sit down, you'll get angry again. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, I've asked a lot of questions already. I, I'm, I'm pretty cool. Plus, I, I'm going to, um, I have a lot more questions, and I'll email you and, um, sure. and do that. So, if, does anyone else have, uh, yes, there's another person. Okay. <clears throat> Hello. Hello. How are you? Good, thank you. <laughs> um, can you just show me how you got into, because I was trying to get into um, what you were in, the stories, and I could not All right. do that. Let me get to the shared screen and see you. Okay, and start. Bingo. I'm sorry. Right. I'm sorry. My name is Joni. <laughs> sorry to introduce yeah. myself. <laughs> All right. So typically, you arrive at the learn page. All right. Let's go to the learn page. So anyone coming in would hit this. Now you don't have these because you don't have any record of, oh. of lessons, right? So what you would do is you would. I think the way the system works now is when you join, you're, you're asked to indicate your level, and then the system will recommend some lessons at your level. Or if you want to go to other courses, you click on new courses, and, and you, can rec you can choose beginner one, beginner two, whatever level you want. Oh, okay. okay? And then you can, and then we have a, a sort of a cloud here. You can entertainment, Argentinian accent, I mean, podcast, business, whatever you want. And so you can have beginner one and two uh, and, uh, you know, go to economics and see what it turns out. No, you're not going to get anything in there. Go ahead a second. I'm, 
I know that they're, we will hold it now. New course, so it looks like, there we are. So if there is, is something that corresponds to the level and the subject that you've chosen, it'll pop up. If you're not satisfied with that, you can go and search in the library. But, whoops, in the library. So, but what happens is, there's so much stuff in the library, it's often difficult to find. And that's where I think a teacher should help direct search. Because there's just a lot of stuff. Okay. And, uh, and you, can, you, can look, you can search by course, or you can search by lesson. You can search by level. Uh, you can also, there are more filters you can search by. You can search, again, you have the tags here. Uh, you know, new words percentage, audio duration. You can search for those that have translations, and notes, and videos. So there's a whole bunch of ways that you can search. But we found that more, you know, less is often more, and the more stuff you put in front of people, the more confused they get. Right. So we try to simplify it. The ideal thing is that if, say, one of your students, you would have their lessons. If they press the Learn page, they get the lessons that they're working on. So they don't have to go to the library. It's all there for them. Thank you. And thereafter, whatever, they let, whatever they've been on is going to show up in their learn page. But it isn't, I agree, it can be a bit uh, confusing at first to get them. Thank you. Can I ask you another question? Sure. Um, there uh, is this theory that the best time to learn a foreign language is when you're a child. Right. Um, I mean, what do um, you, well, how was that experience with you? Uh, did you... Did you, do you feel that in your later years learning as many languages as you have, do you feel as though that that theory would be incorrect for you, or what's your opinion on, on that theory? I think that probably uh, before the age of 10 is the best time to learn a language. However, what are the consequences for that? I'm no longer 10. I still want to learn a language, so theoretically, maybe I was a better language learner at age seven than I am today. But in reality, it, and, and certainly we've seen that immigrants who arrive before the age of 10 end up speaking without an accent, and immigrants who arrive past the age of 15, some do, some don't. And past the age of 20, mostly they don't. So at least as far as accent is concerned, and I think the reason is that when we are young, certainly before the age of five, our brains are sort of flexible and forming, and, and they tend to sort of solidify around a certain language. So these sounds, these structures, they get firmer and firmer in terms of, of, of you know, what's happening in our brain. And so as you get, you have more and more experience with that language, then introducing another language becomes increasingly difficult, at least theoretically. Uh, however, there are other factors. And I am a much more motivated language learner today than I was in high school. So theoretically, maybe um, my brain was more flexible as a 15-year-old, but I had no motivation. So, I mean, I have learned in the last 10 years, in my 60s, I've learned six languages. There is no way when I was in high school that I was going to learn six languages. Right. Right. No way. Right. So, so y there are compensations. There's no <laughs> I think there is sufficient research that demonstrates that we can continue to create new neural connections. Um, so, um, and, and, and uh, as adults, we have things that, that the 15-year-old doesn't have. We have more life experience, we have more knowledge, we have a bigger vocabulary in our own language. And if we're motivated, I, I see, like, if I just look at myself, as I say, I'm a better language learner today than I was when I was 15. Wow. Uh, but theoretically, uh, I think, especially before the age of five, six, seven, I mean, yeah, they learn very quickly. Right. And, and I suppose learning all these languages keeps you looking young. <laughs> <laughs> but it does keep the brain, you know, active. Uh, there's no question. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Hello. Going back to the question. Hello. Going back to the question of learning languages when you're young, since you missed that opportunity. Right. I I have a question. When I was two, three, and four, my parents lived abroad, 
and then we came back. I'm the only one of seven that speaks Swedish of the right. children. I went back as a teenager. My dreams would happen in Swedish, even though I had no clue what anybody was saying. Right. What was the longest you put a language on hold for and came back to it? And have you ever dreamt in a language that you can't even figure out what you're dreaming about, but it's going on? A couple of things. First of all, <laughs> I was born in Sweden. Oh, nice. When I was five. Uh huh. So I also wanted to relate that. I moved to Canada when I was five. I have no recollection in school of transitioning from Swedish to English. I was with kids. All of a sudden we communicated. Whatever. I must have had an accent. I must have struggled. I have no recollection. There were kids we spoke. And, and that was it. So I think that's one thing. So that young kids that just want to communicate, they just transition. And, and I think we do a lot of them a disservice by segregating them in the ESL class where they're only with speakers of other languages. In a way, that was at least my experience. Young enough, they'll just learn. I also, and then I subsequently forgot Swedish. And I have an uncle, and my family, my parents are originally from Czechoslovakia. But I have an uncle, and I had a cousin lived in Sweden. At the age of 16, I flew to Sweden. And my uncle and cousin came out to the airport to meet my cousin, who was so keen to see his only living relative, couldn't <laughs> communicate with me. And I remember he was crying because he was so keen. So I had forgotten my sweet. But we don't completely forget. Uh -huh. And I, this gets back to, uh, I think it was Jordan, right? Yeah, that yeah. this learning and forgetting, uh, we don't completely forget. And when we bring it back, and then uh, I subsequently did a lot of business in Sweden, had to learn Swedish. I did a lot of listening to, again, books on history and stuff, and it came back. My experience with putting languages on hold is, if you have enough input, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you can leave them for a long time, and they don't get worse, they get better. If you have had enough input. If you have learned the grammar and a few words, you're gonna lose that. But my experience, for example, I had to go off to Sweden, I listened to tons of Swedish, read, listened, whatever. I put my Chinese on hold, even though I had just bought these CDs in Beijing of uh, you know, Chinese storytelling and all this kind of stuff. And when I came back, I went back to the Chinese CDs, I understood them better. And I'm not the only person, I've said this in my YouTube videos, and other people have found this to be the case. When you learn, leave it aside, and relearn it, whether it gestates in your brain or whether it's the fact of having to retrieve it again, you end up stronger. And my other question was, because this happened in a dream, I mean, I'm seeing my old, older relatives talking Swedish in my head, and I'm like, I don't know what they're saying. It took a while, but I caught on and finished high school over there. But sometimes I'll be dreaming, and I'll be dreaming with people talking in a different language, and I'm like, wait a minute, they don't speak Russian. Why are they speaking Russian to each other? Do you ever have your I've dreams had... in different languages and different people speaking things? So I just have to question. In the reality shows of my dream. <laughs> <laughs> I have to ask that question. People only speak their own language. If they're going to show up as bit characters speaking other languages, okay. as my dream flits through all kinds of improbable scenarios, it, those would be speakers of those languages. I've never, I can't recollect, it's possible, but I can't recollect having, you know, uh, uh, French speakers speak Japanese or something. I okay. I, okay. Right. No, I just question because, but, you know. Why not? Because the dreams, I mean, they go anywhere. And I usually wake up if somebody's speaking something that's not, like if a Japanese speaker were speaking French in my dream, I'd wake up and say, this can't be real. Oh, yeah. So, oh, all right. That was know. my question. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, I can't. I haven't had that experience. Buenos tardes. Buenos tardes. Uh, I have a few years on you. Okay. Oh, you look uh, younger than me. Oh, gracias. <laughs> and I'm... Uh, I started learning Spanish about eight years ago, right. and after five or six years, I got fr so frustrated because I wasn't learning it from the academic point of view that a friend of mine and I, at uh, lifelong learning at the University of Delaware, see a senior like me, started experimenting with trying to figure out how are we going to teach Spanish to these seniors in an hour, hour and a quarter a week. And so we started experimenting about three years ago, and we finally have come up with I won't call it a recipe, but some inexpensive modules that we can use to really 
get them involved in talking to one another. The um, using something like your uh, system is a lot like what we've been looking for for them to use offline or away from it because the, the idea of hearing it as they can look at it is important for these older folks. I've been using Fluent U myself which is videos from YouTube in Spanish then with lessons around them. Um, the difficulty with that is that the, the speaking uh, is very fast and it's, so it's not appropriate for beginners but I like, I like what you've done. Um, and I just uh, put the uh, app on my iPad and I like the layout a lot better than the one that's available on a, a browser. It's a lot cleaner and simpler and I think it would be a lot easier for the seniors to manipulate it. So I really, I really, really want to give you an applause. Incidentally, I've only learned about what Stephen has done in the last month. Uh. So my whole history reflects what he has done independently. And you too. So, you know, very nice. Thank you. Thank you. So, um... I, we could go on and talk for hours and hours about this, but we have to choke off because uh, people have to go and do stuff. But there's about 20, 25 people here, 30 people here, and um, it's great to get the word out. It's, it's really great to get the word out about, uh, I think, if, if you're, I'm just going to say, like, if you understand the message, you're acquiring the language. And if it's interesting enough, that, that that's how you get it, you know, and... Um, and so thank you so much for doing this, and, um, and thank you for, um, for your videos that I discovered online a couple of years ago, and I started following you and, um, and getting psyched about learning languages again. I, first I went to Stephen Krashen, and I w saw some of his stuff from the 1980s, and he was, because um, I have everything on, his, on him on YouTube, and I got excited, and then I was going, and I ran into you, and then I got excited, and I ran into a bunch of other polyglots, and I started... And then I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that. So I started learning Portuguese. Oh, I have a quick question. Um, get, tell me a couple of the languages that you had where you did no speaking at all. You just got so much input that you could just start speaking fluently. Um, no well, speaking. Just hardly yeah. zero. In, it's not, okay, let me, a couple of, a couple of languages. Um, Czech. Or well, Russian. I, I guess I guess I listened for two years before I started speaking. Mm -hmm. Because I had no one to speak to, and I found it uncomfortable. I mean, we have Russian tutors at Link, but to get on and not understand what they're saying and stuff, and I, I said, okay, I've got a half an hour to spend or an hour. What am I going to spend it on? I was I found it more enjoyable to read Anna Karenina and to listen to the audiobook and to have that experience rather than to confront this much more stressful situation of having to speak to someone. Yes. Until I got to the point where the words and phrases were almost exploding out of me, and then I wanted to sit down with someone and speak. Yes. I did the same with Czech. So if Russian was two years, Czech was six months, because a lot of the Slavic grammar now repeats, and some of the vocabulary repeats. Mm -hmm. uh, in the case of Romanian, because we do business in Romania, and I had to go there, so I, I basically had two months. So one month, was straight listening and reading, exposing myself to content, and then I, I had to practice speaking because I, I was going to go there. Yeah. But with Romanian, it's seventy percent very close to Italian, twenty percent Slavic origin words. So it's it, it all depends on how similar in terms of vocabulary and structure it is to a language you already know. Mm -hmm. So, but there again, I mean, I I, I basically the Korean. I've hardly spoken any Korean. I delay the speaking until I feel confident that I can understand what they're saying. Yes. And that's part of the paramount of vocabulary. Yes. yes. Oh, how does it feel when you start to speak? <laughs> Painful at first. You can avoid the fact that that initially you're going to stumble. And uh, but um, yeah, you just gotta you gotta work through it. But at least if you have a sufficient preparation, uh, you'll eventually struggle through. If you start that painful process without 
the vocabulary and without yes. familiarity with the language, it's a much, much longer process. But you're going to stumble. There's no one, I don't believe that, you know, you have your passive phase and then you just activate one day. It, yeah. it didn't happen to me. But it's surprising how much you can, you can say. And, and eventually, to become, quote, fluent, you have to speak a lot. Yeah, I have a, th I, I don't know, I, I really had an experience with um, Portuguese when I just, I just read so much and listened to so much, and then I went to Middlebury, and I hadn't really spoken with anybody, just pre pretending to speak to myself, but that wasn't really doing anything. And um, I just started having this conversation with the guy, and yeah, I was basically speaking fluently, and I had not, it was all input, it was all input. Right, but... Portuguese and Spanish are almost the no, same. No, that's what I mean. But I mean, like, it, it, it was all input. And with French right now, I don't really speak it, but I've got a lot of input right now. And maybe it'll take me longer. Maybe it'll take me another year. But I think that, if, and I don't speak it with anybody. And I, I guarantee you that I think in about a year, I'm going to be able to do it. Yeah, I mean, I feel the same way. It's, it's how similar are the languages. So with yeah. Russian and Czech, with Ukrainian, I can almost start speaking. I mean, I struggle to look for the words. But, and Ukrainian is so similar to Polish that I think Polish would be, you know, that much faster. So it's how similar the languages are. Yes. Yeah. Is a yeah. determining factor. Well, thank you so much. This was so awesome. And um, I hope that, uh, that it was I informative for everyone. I wasn't poor at the beginning. I, I moved. Maybe I should have started in this room rather than where I started. <laughs> <laughs> no, but this, this was really great. Um, you have no idea what a gift this is for me and what a gift it is for a lot of the people in here. And I'm so glad that two St. Andrews students here, one of my, one of my two favorite students here, the two <laughs> good two favorite students here, are here to like learn from you and they can spread the word, you know? So um, this is I great. Enjoy it. I can always talk to language enthusiasts. That's, I know. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you very much. And, um, hey. and I hope to be in contact with you um, more in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.